Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This Bible study is going to be the clean versus the unclean, or the holy versus the unclean holy. Our introductory verse is going to be 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17. Paul says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. That's some pretty good advice. The Lord wants us to come out from among them, to be separate, and not to touch the unclean thing. Uh, you could also say the unholy thing. Now, I am not a trained Levitical priest. That's what the book of Leviticus was for. And if you ever decide you want to read the book of Hebrews, before you read the book of Hebrews, you should read the book of Leviticus. Really. Because that's what uh, replaced the old covenant of Leviticus. Leviticus had a whole bunch of different rules. So, let's just take a gander at Leviticus 10.10. 10. And that ye may put difference between holy and unholy, and between unclean and clean. Now, there's a number of things. There were clean meats and unclean meats. And this really is, I'm just kind of going over this real quick. But uh, cattle were considered clean. Obviously pigs were unclean. Fish with uh, fins and scales, clean. Shellfish, unclean. And there was a book I had when I first came to the Lord, oh, I don't know, 30-something years ago. And it was not a new book back then. I wish I still had it. I gave it away when I was moving. And um, it was written by a doctor. And kind of an interesting story, my opinion. Guy was a, a medical doctor and didn't have a lot of you know, back in the old days, doctors didn't really study nutrition. Uh, up until 1980, um, you could go to any med school and nutrition was an elective. However, the nurses had to take at least, uh, well, the registered nurses at least, had to take a college-level class in nutrition. So the nurses knew more about nutrition than the average doctor, uh, the great majority of doctors. But this doctor had married a Christian woman, and, you know, he, his thoughts were, hey, I'm a man of science, and, you know, I really don't, you know, I don't really, uh, I want to show the wife the error of her ways. I'm going to prove the Bible wrong and uh, show her how foolish the Bible is. Well, about seven years later, when he got through trying to disprove all the laws in the Bible, he became a firm believer. He said, this book was not written by some shepherd on the hill. Um, he studied the dietary laws. He discovered that pork, pigs, transmitted over 100 different diseases to man that were uh, proven and then there was like 200 suspected, but, you know, they hadn't done the um, research to actually prove it. And, you know, he's like, okay, well that, that's good. And then when you were um, trying to um, 
like hand washing. Uh, there was a doctor, Swiss, I think he was Swiss. His name was Semmelweis. He lived around 1890 or so. And the doctors back in the ho his hospital would uh, wash their hands in a, a pan. And they would go from patient to patient to patient. And now we would know that, you know, when you wash your hands in the same pan with five different pa patients... It's called cross-contamination. Well, Semmelweis, I, th I think he was a believer. I'm not sure. It's been a long time. But uh, he, the Bible said to use running water, running water to cleanse yourself. And, you know, that's why we use soap. Actually, the soap is not to kill the germs, but just that the, um, to break the surface tension between the bacteria on our hands and the water so that the bacteria would um, become, you know, become separated and loose from your hands and then wash away. I mean, they do have antibacterial soap. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about plain soap. But Semmelweis was trying to get his doctors uh, to use running water and he delivered babies. And the, the women knew that the, uh, when he delivered children that they would more often than not be healthy. Whereas the other doctors, their babies would get sick and die. So, you know, if they were superstitious, they would say, well, you know, Dr. Semmelweis is, uh, you know, when he delivers a baby, they usually live. But the other doctors, they get sick and die. And they laughed him to scorn, and, you know, I think they kicked him out of the hospital eventually. Because, you know, let's face it, you get 100 women and 75 of them want just one doctor instead of the other doctors. You know, he was cutting into their business, so they got together and got rid of him, you know. But it uh, wasn't until later that they discovered, you know, uh, bacteria with the microscope that they found out that... Uh, cross-contamination and I mean you're talking like 1890s I mean really you think about it that's what 130 years ago I think it was 1890s I don't remember you could look up Dr. Semmelweis hand washing and the Bible told the Levitical priests to you know wash in running water um, they had all kinds of rules about uh, for uh, like quarantines now you quarantine sick people you don't quarantine healthy people that's they're doing the opposite of what the Bible says to do today with the uh, car Ona thing so yeah you quarantine sick people and that's actually in the Bible too um, the priests, they were to wash themselves before they uh, went into service, uh, do service in the tabernacle. I guess that in a way was kind of a ceremonial cleansing of the body and probably a precursor to the baptism of John the Baptist. I don't know. I'm just kind of throwing that out there. But I think there's some valid validity to that. Um. There were rules about, uh, like, when a woman had her time of the month, a man wasn't to touch her because she was considered unclean. Uh, when she would sit on a bed and there was an issue of blood on it, you know, they had all kinds of rules about, you know, you, you couldn't sit on it or lay on it. You'd have to clean it, run it, you know, wash it, whatever. Um, when a man had fun with his wife and he was done, and uh, I don't know how, well, let's just say uh, he became a sperm donor. I don't know any other way to describe it, but there was, you know, that was a, they were supposed to wash their flesh and water and be unclean until the evening. So, you know, they had all these different rules and things, and that's why um, the Bible tells us that we couldn't keep 
the law. We just couldn't do it. I mean, it, somebody's counted them and says there's 613 different laws. And, uh, you know, if you were five years old and broke one, well, guess what? You're guilty. So Christ, Christ broke it down to two laws, love the Lord and love thy neighbor. Well, actually three laws. He also said to love, uh, love, love the brethren, to love one another. Now, I don't think he was talking about loving Satan and the devil's kids, but but that's uh, you know you had all these different um, laws. Oh, well, and the point I was making with the doctor was uh, he got when well, he looked at all these different laws, the diet laws, the health laws, the quarantine laws. He looked at all this stuff and he goes, "These laws are probably forty five hundred years old." He says, you know, you might get a you might guess on a few things and get some things right. But he says, all these different things, he says, it's impossible. Somebody had to have known all this stuff. You know, the quarantine, uh, the leprosy, the I was just he was just flabbergasted, uh, the dietary laws. Um, you know, he was just like, this is unbelievable. The clean meats and the unclean meats. People get sick and die from eating unclean meats. You know, eating pork and shellfish is not a salvational issue. But uh, if you eat garbage and you get sick, um, don't be surprised if you pray the Lord to make you healthy. And, he, and the answer is no. Well, you know, there's a reason for it. You know? You, you eat garbage. Uh, we got a something I learned uh, in computer science when I was in college. Garbage in, garbage out. And it still holds true today. So Leviticus 10.10, 10, he says, And that ye might put a difference between holy and unholy and between clean and unclean. Now we've been talking about the physical realm how about a spiritual application? Well, let's take a look. All right, let's go to the book of Joshua. And oh, by the way, next time you hear somebody say Yeshua, they're mispronouncing it. It's Joshua. Joshua means savior or salvation. I honestly, I think these uh, Talmudists mispronounce words on purpose. But that's just my opinion. I'm sorry when I was taking, uh, I never took Hebrew in Bible college. Sorry, but uh, Yiddish is not Hebrew either. So it just looks like it and sometimes sort of sounds like it, but it's not. Joshua, he, he took over for uh, Moses after Moses died when they crossed over uh, the river to the promised land where Satan had his Canaanites children waiting for them to oppose them. And uh, guess what? Not much has changed. Now, we talked about a physical application. Let's talk about a spiritual application. Joshua chapter 7. And by the way, people, go to um, the King James Bible Online.org, O R G, King James Bible Online.org, and, uh, you know, pull it up and figure out how to, you know, Joshua chapter 7. And please read along with me. Um, I'm just not smart enough to, to be doing videos. Um, I would love to be able to. Uh, you know, everybody. A couple of you were mentioning that you'd like to be able to read along with me on the screen, but I just I don't know how to do video editing and all that kind of stuff. I'm, you know, that was enough for me just learning how to do audio and then convert it to a video with the slideshow. You know, I'm kind of low tech when it comes to that kind of stuff, and and it's just me. You know, it'd be different if I had a production crew and a church helping me and you know but it's just me guys gals you know it's just me and um yeah it would 
I've had people tell me it takes, it's a lot of work to do um, video. And then even if I did do the, the uh, video, um, I'd have to match it to the audio. And I tried doing that a couple times. It didn't work very well. So, sorry. All right. Joshua 7, verse 1. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing, the unclean, the unholy, the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Camri, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Huh. One person did something that they weren't supposed to do, and the Lord was angry with everybody. How do you think the Lord feels today? We got the Church of Satan that was incorporated in the United States on um, June 6, 1966. Um, the founder was uh, Anton Levy. Well, he changed his name to LeVay. They tried to pawn his name off as being um, Howard Stanton, but don't believe that garbage. Uh, one of his girlfriends, I heard, was... Uh, not Marilyn Monroe. Who was the other one? Jane Mansfield. And supposedly they had a daughter. And she's an actress on, uh, what is it, uh, Law and Order, CSI or whatever, or Special Victims Unit or whatever. Um, he, she was Stabler's partner. I don't even remember her name. The only reason I remember Stabler was because uh, he was. that was the name of a... Uh, uh, great quarterback on the uh, Oakland Raiders. Yeah, I know I'm dating myself. Boy, am I dating myself. But uh, yeah, yeah. So the possible daughter of uh, the Church of Satan founder is on television. Dad used to watch that. Ugh. And how do you think that he feels about uh, the Lord feels about abortion? You know, filth on TV, prayer taken out of school. Uh, you know, here it is, the Lord punished Israel for one person. And here it is, we got a country full of people, full of false doctrines, dead babies, church of Satan. Uh, I mean, you know, unbelievable. And the churches and sodomite marriage to boot. And and these and these churches think they're going to fly away any second and avoid the judgment. The Bible even says that judgment begins at the house of God. Judgment begins, not wrath. And they don't even know the difference between judgment and wrath. Oh, makes me sick. All right. Uh, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah took the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Verse 2. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai. Artificial intelligence? Ai. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Beth Haven, on the east side of Bethel. Now, the word Beth means house. And El is a contraction for the Lord. So Bethel means basically house, house of the Lord or house of God. But I'll guarantee it wasn't the God of the Bible. And spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai, and make not all the people to labor, labor thither, for they are but few. Verse 4. But they went up thither of the people about 3,000 men, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai smote of them about 30 and 6 men, for they chased them from before the gate, even unto Shebarim, and smote them in the going down, wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. And Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord 
until the eventide, he and the elders of Israel, and put dust upon their heads. If only the leaders of the, our country would fall upon the earth on their face before the Lord and put dust on their face, you know, rent their clothes and dust on their heads and show sorrow. No, that ain't going to happen. Verse 7, And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Would to God we would have been content and dwelt on the other side, Jordan. O Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their backs before their enemies? And you know what gets me? The churches think that, oh, everybody can be saved. God loves everybody. We, God doesn't have any enemies. Right here it says Israel has enemies. I mean, come on. Verse 9, For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it and shall environ us round and cut off our name from the earth and what wilt thou do unto thy great name and the lord said unto joshua get thee up wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face israel hath sinned and they have transgressed my covenant which i commanded them for they have taken of the accursed thing and have also stolen and dissembled also, and have put it even among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turn their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you any more, except ye destroy the accursed from among you. Now America and Europe, oh, we love the accursed things. We love it. Matter of fact, we, we give them special privileges by law, by government decree. Oh, God bless America, right? Every time I see that on somebody's bumper sticker on a sign, I'm thinking, are you a Satanist? Because the God of the Bible is not going to bless America. That's for no Verse 13, up, telling Joshua to get up, up, sanctify the people and say, sanctify yourselves against tomorrow, for thus saith the Lord God of Israel, there is an accursed thing in the midst of thee. O Israel, thou canst not stand before thine enemies until ye take away the accursed thing from among you. Guess what, people? How about a spiritual application today? Do you know that every time the United States has won, uh, fought a war against communism, we've never won? We didn't win in Vietnam. We didn't win in Korea. Oh, we, we signed up an armistice, but that's, that's not a peace treaty. That's just, well, we won't shoot at you if you don't shoot at us. I mean, really, you think about it. We have never won a war against communism. Never. Of course, when you find out who is behind communism, Wall Street, um, you'll, not, you'll understand why. I mean, at the end of World War II, we could have taken Russia, and communist Russia, and wiped them out. You know, they murdered millions upon millions of Christians. And what did we do? think about it. You know what we did? Well, when they murdered all the Christian farmers, uh, they had bad weather, and they killed their farmers, and they had a crop failure, a co almost a complete and total crop failure that year. And there would have been starvation, and the people probably would have rose up and overthrown them. But they went to the United States and says, hey, uh, we had a crop failure. Can you feed us? And the United States says, oh, sh sure, no problem. Even though you murdered millions of Christians, 
no problem. We'll feed you. No problem. And they did. And guess what happened to America? Read about the Dust Bowl. Read about the Dust Bowl. And we had the Depression. Yeah, God bless America. That was in the... Um, or, yeah, read about the Dust Bowl. We, it was horrible. It was horrible. People were caught out in the, uh, in the open when the dust storms would hit. They'd get sand in their eyes and, go, and they went blind because they couldn't wash the sand out. I mean, it's kind of hard to go back home when you're out in the middle of a field and your eyes are full of sand from, uh, you know, tropical force uh, winds. And um, it, was, it was a problem, big problem. God was sending America a wake-up call, but did we listen? No. Next thing you know, World War II. America repent? No. 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 All right. Verse 14. So what does God tell Joshua? In the morning thereof, ye shall be brought according to your tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord taketh shall come according to the families thereof, and the family which the Lord shall take shall come by households, and the households which the Lord shall take shall come man by man. And it shall be that he that is taken with the accursed thing shall be burnt with fire. Burnt with fire. I did a study on fire. Fire is not always a bad thing. Uh, for somebody... Evil, yeah, fire is going to be a bad thing. But for the believers, Jesus even said he was going to, uh, well, John said that Jesus would uh, baptize us with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And fire would burn away our earthly works. And all that would remain is our heavenly works. You know, treasures in heaven, right? So, and it shall be that he that is taken with the accursed thing shall be burnt with fire, he and all that he hath, because he hath transgressed the covenant of the Lord, because he hath wrought folly in Israel. So Joshua rose up early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes, and the tribe of Judah was taken. And he brought the family of Judah, and he took the family of the Zarhites, and he brought forth the family of the Zarhites, man by man, and Jabni was taken. And he brought his household man by man, man and Achan, the son of Kamri, the son of Zebdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was taken. And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him, and tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment, he saw a beautiful garment from Babylon. You want to be clothed with Babylon? Huh? I don't want to be clothed with Babylon. I want to be clothed with uh, a white robe washed in the blood of Jesus. Well, but that's just me. And when I saw this, among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment and 200 shekels of silver, boy, that's a lot of silver, people, and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels, weight. Now, a shekel's a weight, people. Oh, let me hit you with this real quick. Do you know what the definition of a dollar is? A dollar is one ounce of 90% silver. That's what a dollar is. I haven't seen a dollar in circulation since 1964. I mean, I've seen, I've seen them, but that's when they took uh, the silver coins out of circulation in the United States. A silver dollar would buy 20 candy bars back then. I know, because I... Well, I didn't buy 20, but I would take a quarter and buy five and then share with my best buddy who uh, I don't see anymore because he'd rather smoke weed and snort cocaine than hear about Jesus. 
And I loved him like a brother. And I hope he gets saved one day, but I doubt it. Uh, what are you going to do? So, the guy I saw, uh, uh, clothing from Babylon, 200 shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight. Then I coveted them and took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent, and the silver under it. And Josh, so Joshua sent messengers, and they ran into the tent. Behold, it was hidden in his tent, and the silver under it. Oh boy, here comes the punchline. And they took them out of the midst of the tent, and brought them unto Joshua and all the children of Israel, and laid them out before the Lord. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver and the garment and the wedge of gold, and his sons and his daughters, and his oxen and his asses, and his sheep and his tent, and all that he had, and they brought them unto the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones and burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. Wow. Not only the guy, but every, all his children. Ah, Verse 26. And they raised over him a great heap of stones unto this day, so that the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Wherefore, the name of that place was called the Valley of Achor unto this day. Oh, yeah. Spiritual application, people. When the Lord wants you to do something or not to do something, do it. And I'm a fine one to talk. I'm a hypocrite sometimes. Not always. Not always. But sometimes. All right, let's uh, let's go to Isaiah sixty four and verse Isaiah sixty four. All right, Isaiah sixty four and verse four. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. Thou meetest him that rejoiceth and worketh righteousness. Those that remember thee in thy ways, behold, thou art wroth, for we have sinned. In those is, in those is continuance, and we shall be saved." But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. Boy, that's the truth. All our righteousness are as filthy rags, and we do all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And there is none that calleth upon thy name that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee because thou hast hid thy face from us and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. But now, O Lord, thou art our father. We are the clay and thou our potter and we are all the work of thy hand. Be not wroth, very sore, O Lord, neither remember iniquity forever. Behold, see, we beseech thee, we are all thy people. The holy cities are a wilderness, Zion is a wilderness, Jerusalem a desolation. Our holy and our beautiful home, where our fathers praise thee, is burned up with fire, and all our pleasant things are laid waste. Wilt thou refrain thyself for these things, O Lord? Wilt thou hold thy peace, and afflict us very sore? Uh, maybe I should have read the whole chapter. I didn't know it was a, such a short chapter. Verse 1, uh, O that thou wouldest rend the heavens, that thou wouldest come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. And when the melting fire burneth, the fire causeth the waters to boil, to make thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence, 
When thou didst terrible things, when we looked not for, thou camest down, the mountains flowed down at thy presence. And that was verses 1, 2, and 3. I should have read the whole thing, but I was trying to make this a short study. All right, let's take a look. All right, so there was a spiritual application there for the you know, wanting to wear a Babylonian covering, a garment. And the gold and the silver were supposed to go into the treasury of the Lord. Now, I wonder, there are times when um, certain items are dedicated to the devil, to Satan, or, you know, some other false satanic god, per se, They're uh, like idols and what have you. Believe me, there are things dedicated to the devil. There was a gal I knew, her youngest daughter was having night terrors. And she told me about this, and I'm like, oh. You know, the daughter kept saying, there's monsters in the closet, Mommy. Well... I told her, I says, you know what you need to do? She goes, what? I says, go through the house. Everything. You've got some items in the house that are um, dedicated to the devil. Well, she actually took my word for it, went through the house, uh, found at least one book, if not two or three, or more. I don't know how many. I just remember there was, said there was a book, um, on like, I, I don't remember exactly what the book was about, but it was a, something to do with witchcraft and what have you. And uh, she found it, got rid of it, and guess what? No more night terrors. No more monsters in the closet. You know? I mean, I, I kind of knew what it was. And, uh, you know, people get scared when you tell them this kind of stuff you know they're more afraid of the devil's stuff than there are the lord because the lord sits back and lets them do whatever they want to do and one day the bill's going to come due you know but um you know yeah who listens to bob what does bob know all right um let's go to the book of judges this is kind of a spiritual application, too. Cause and effect. Uh, in the Eastern religions, they call it uh, karma. There's a certain amount of truth to it, you know. You do things that displease the Lord, it'll, it'll catch up to you. Judges chapter 13. I would hope to... Uh, I would hope to God that you people know this story. Judges 13. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. Sound familiar? And the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines 40 years. Now, some of the Philistines, I don't know if all of them, but at least some of them were the giants. Goliath was one of, of the Philistines. Now, I don't know if all the Philistines were giants, but I know that Goliath was. Verse 2, And there was a certain man of Zorah, and of the family of the Danites, tribe of Dan, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren, and bare not. So she couldn't have any kids, and the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold, now thou art barren and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Now, theref uh, now therefore beware, beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. Don't be getting drunk, don't be drinking alcohol, and don't eat pig and don't eat shellfish. 
or vultures or mice or, you know. Yeah, everybody tells me, well, you know, God made every all the meats clean. We can eat anything you want. Okay, well, come over to my house for dinner and I'll prepare uh, you uh, rat, mice, and vulture. How's that? Bon appetit. So, don't drink alcohol, don't eat unclean things. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head. Ah, for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. He's going to be a Nazarite unto God from the womb. Uh, where was Jesus born? Bethlehem, right? But what? where did he live? Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth, right? In Galilee. All right, so, For the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Then the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came unto me, and his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God, very terrible. But I asked him not whence he was, neither told me his name. But he said unto me, Behold, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and now drink no wine nor strong drink, neither eat any unclean thing. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Then Manoah entreated the Lord and said, O my, my, uh, o my Lord, let the man of God which thou didst send come again unto us and teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born. And God hearkened to the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came again unto the woman as she sat in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. And the woman made haste and ran and showed her husband and said unto him, Behold, the man hath appeared unto me that came unto me the other day. And Manoah arose and went after his wife, and came to the man and said unto him, Art thou the man that speakest unto the woman? And he said, I am. And Manoah said, Now let thy words come to pass. Now let thy words come to pass. He's saying, Okay, what you're saying I want to happen and come true. As opposed to what uh, Zacharias did when... Um, Gabriel told him he was going to have a son. And he was like, Psst, how can that be? My wife and I, we're, we're old. You know, Psst, she's well past that age. How's that going to happen? And what did, what did the, that was in the book of Luke, if I remember correctly. And Gabriel did what? He shut his mouth for uh, probably nine months. So, you know, there's a difference between uh, questioning the Lord and saying and asking, well, I believe you, but can you explain? Can you elaborate? Can you, you know, tell me how this is going to happen? There's a big difference between that and saying, how can that be? My wife is old. I'm old. We can't have kids. You're nuts. You know, that's the Bob translation, so. Now let thy words come to pass. How shall we order the child, and how shall we do unto him? And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Of all that I said unto the woman, let her beware. She may not eat of anything that cometh of the vine. So no raisins, no grapes. Neither let her drink wine or strong drink, nor any unclean thing. All that I command her, let her observe. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, I pray thee, let us detain thee until we have made ready a kid for thee. And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Though thou detain me, I will not eat of thy bread. And if thou wilt offer a burnt offering, thou must offer it unto the Lord. For Manoah knew not that he was an angel of the Lord. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, What is thy name? That when thy sayings come to pass, we may do thee honor. What is thy name? 
And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Why askest thou thus after my name, seeing it is secret? Ah. Now, the um, Satanists have got a stupid thing. Uh, they actually believe this and teach this, that if you know the secret name of an angel, you know, probably the fallen ones, I'm sure, that uh, when you summon them and you know their name, you have to do their bidding. So, you know why um, uh, when they do their little rituals, their little casting, their little spells, and they do all these little rituals, you know why the devils probably have them do that? Is so that they understand what they're trying to get done so that they'll, when they do it, these people think that they have control over these fallen angels. When in actuality, these fallen angels have control over them. I mean, consorting with the devils, the enemies of God. I mean, not only are you, you digging a hole, but you're digging it deeper. And the hole's so deep that you can't even throw the dirt out of it anymore. It's landing on top of your head. You're burying yourself. Literally. You're digging your way to hell. And these people actually believe that. Hey, my name's Bob. Uh, I tell you what, say my name and tell me to go do something. Hey, let's see how it works. And you think, I'm more powerful than an angel? I don't think so. Uh, and these people actually believe this garbage. Oh, if I know this angel's secret name, uh, he's got to do what I tell him. Yeah, you see that supermodel over there? I want her to fall in love with me. Yeah, right. Or I want you to grab uh, some money out of that bank. You know, I don't think so. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Why askest thou thus after my name, seeing it a secret? So Manoah took a kid with a meat offering and offered it unto a rock unto the Lord. And the angel did wondrously, and Manoah and his wife looked on. And it came to pass when the flame went up toward heaven from off the altar that the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar. And Manoah and his wife looked on it and fell on their faces to the ground. And the angel of the Lord did no more appear to Manoah and to his wife. than Manoah knew that he was an angel of the Lord. And Manoah said unto his wife, We shall surely die because we have seen God. Um, there are some instances where the angel of the Lord, uh, some Bible scholars, and sometimes me, believe that sometimes when the Bible's talking about the angel of the Lord, angel means messenger, that sometimes it was Christ in his pre, uh, before his body, before he was carnated into his incarnation into human flesh. Because sometimes the angel of the Lord spoke in the first person uh, for God. And he would say things like, I or we. Um, I think I did a Bible study on that. And other people have done Bible studies probably better than mine. Um, you could look up Jesus, the angel of the Lord, Old Testament, and uh, makes an interesting study. Um, I think the burning bush was one example but that does that's not always the case that's not always the case okay but sometimes it was the angel of the lord was sometimes i believe christ and other times not so it's just an interesting thing and manoah said unto his wife we shall surely die because we have seen god but his wife said unto him if the lord were pleased to kill us he would have not received a burnt offering and a meat offering at our hands, neither would he have showed us all these things, nor would, as at this time, have told us such things as these. And the woman bare a son and called his name Samson. Samson! And the child grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah 
an ish towel tail something like that so separating the clean from the unclean that's why he didn't want her to eating unclean food and drinking wine or any fruit of the vine i from what i understand raisins sun-dried raisins can have um minute amounts of uh alcohol in them so maybe that's why they didn't want her eating fruit of the any fruit of the vine i don't know but you think about it uh samson was a uh, pretty decent guy except for uh he had his eyes on the um the wrong women you know that's been one of my problems uh had me a good woman and wasn't I didn't belong to the Lord then and I mistreated her and she took off and then I chased around uh, the ones I should have stayed away from so I ran off the one that I should have stayed with and went to ones that I should have ran away from stayed with them that I should have ran away from but yeah what are you gonna do Water under that bridge is, went out to the sea. So, yeah, Samson, I, I get it. All right, let's go to Isaiah 6. And I think uh, after this, we'll go to the uh, New Testament. Now, Isaiah, what a wonderful book. Verse 1. In the, king, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Um, guys, you probably don't know what a train is. We're not talking about a lion old, you know. We're not talking about a choo-choo. Um, no. Ladies know this. Um uh, when you get married, a woman's got the, the dress, and the dress hangs in the back like a cape, a long, long cape. Uh, that's a train. I only know that because I used to do weddings. Uh, yeah. I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims type of angel right each one had six wings with twain he covered his face and with twain he covered his feet and with twain he did fly and one cried unto another and said holy 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 is the lord of hosts the whole earth is full of his glory why holy 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 why three times father son holy spirit that's kind of how I look at it. And if you don't understand uh, the Godhead, um, let me know. I'll give you a study on it. Some people like to call it Trinity, but Trinity is not a Bible word, but Godhead is. 1 Timothy 3.16 says, God was manifest in the flesh. The modern Bible versions say he appeared in a body. And like I've said before, everybody that was born has appeared in the body, has appeared in a body. Uh, they want to turn something miraculous, the virgin birth, into just another common thing. Matter of fact, when you see uh, BCE as a dating system instead of uh, BC or AD, BCE stands for Before Common Era. And then when Christ was born, they call it the common era. As if uh, the birth of Christ and the virgin birth was something common. Yeah. So when you see BCE and CE as a dating system, you know you're dealing with Antichrist. Keep that in mind. It's becoming very prevalent today. All right, so, 
Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand. A live coal. A burning coal. Remember, we're going to be tried by fire. John the Baptist said that Jesus would baptize us with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Then one of the seraphims, then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Boy, that'll be a glorious day, huh? The day your iniquity and your sin is taken away. And I heard also, also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. And he said, Go. And tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and, eat, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert, and be healed. Wow. Make the heart of this people fat and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. And people, this is right right taken from uh, where, where they asked Jesus, uh, why do you speak to these people in parables? And guess what Jesus said? Basically, write this out of uh, out of the book of uh, Isaiah. All right, let's uh, hit the New Testament real quick, and we're going to go back to Isaiah. But Matthew 13, verse 1. The same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside, and great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat... And the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. Now, we're not talking about a singer sewing machine. No. No, we're talking about a farmer sowing seed in the field, right? And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and... Forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some an hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And the disciples came and said unto him, why speakest thou unto them in parables? Why speakest thou unto them in parables? Oh, wait a minute, Jesus, why are you telling them these stories? Why don't you tell them plainly? I mean, come on. He answered and said unto them, Jesus speaking, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the, kingdoms, the kingdom of heaven, but to them, it is not given. So to them, they were 
given to understand the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to the other ones, uh-uh, no, not given. All right, verse 12. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing, see not. And hearing, they hear not, neither do they understand. Verse 14. That in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Esaias, Isaiah, the Greek rendering of Isaiah which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be, con and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. Ah, there we go, right? All right, back to Isaiah 6 and verse 10. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert, and be healed. Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, Until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate. And the Lord have removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. But yet in it shall be a tenth, a tithe, right? Yet, but yet in it shall be a tenth, and it shall return, and shall be eaten as a tell tree and as an oak, whose substance is in them when they cast their leaves. So the holy seed, so the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. Now, if there's a holy seed, wouldn't there have to be an unholy seed? Oh, yeah. Why do you think the Lord wants us separate and separate the clean from the unclean, the holy from the unholy? There's a reason there. There's a spiritual and a physical application, people. All right, let's go to Mark chapter 1. Uh, I guess we'll go verse 15 and saying Jesus speaking the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand repent ye and believe the gospel now as he walked by the sea of Galilee he saw Simon and Andrew his brother casting a net into the sea for they were fishers and Jesus saith unto them come ye after me and I will make you to become fishers of men and straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. And when they had gone a little further thence, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the ship, mending their net nets. And straightway he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants and went after him. And they went into Capernaum, and straightway on the Sabbath day he entered into the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. See, the scribes were the copyists of the scriptures, the Bible, the law. Uh, you've heard the word scribble, you know, writing down stuff, you're just scribbling. That's where the, it, it comes from the same root, root word, a scribe. Um, Matter of fact, I think it was German or Spanish. Uh, scriben means uh, writing. So a scribe was, uh, you know, they didn't have book printer, printers back then. So if you wanted a copy of the Bible, you had to hire somebody that knew and could copy it. 
onto whatever you had uh, animal skins or whatever form of type of paper that they had back in the day so that's why they wrote it on scrolls see the scribes they had the letter of the law but what did Jesus have he had the spirit of the law and they were astonished at his doctrine for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes and there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit a devil a demon if you will and there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit and he cried out and you know what today you got people with unclean spirits in the churches yeah and he cried out saying let us alone let us alone what have we to do with thee thou Jesus of Nazareth art thou come to destroy us I know thee thou, who thou art the Holy One of God you know what's sad the devils knew who Jesus was and even after all the miracles and things that he had done the leaders of the Pharisees the Jews they didn't know who he was that is so sad and Jesus rebuked him saying hold thy peace and come out of him and when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice he came out of him and they were all amazed in his, insomuch that they questioned among themselves saying what thing is this what new doctrine what new doctrine is this for with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits and they do obey him oh yeah an unclean spirit maybe we should stay away from unclean spirits what do you think but uh, no today they they go after those unclean spirits all right mark chapter 5 verse 1 and they came over to the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes and when he was come out of the ship immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit huh the tombs the graveyard that's a very appropriate place for an unclean spirit isn't it the place of the burying of the dead a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs and no man could bind him no not with chains because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains and the chains had been plucked asunder by him and the fetters broken in pieces neither could any man tame him this guy had supernatural strength when you could break chains and fetters uh, you know unbelievable strength you know I always w wondered I always watched these uh, was I was always kind of interested in karate and stuff and before I was saved uh, you know I always wondered how in the world could these people do some of the you know these karate experts do some of the things that they do breaking boards that would break your hand you know and I look at this and I wonder are all these people possessed of devils are they doing this by the power of Satan unclean spirits I mean it, a normal man couldn't break a chain no way but this guy could so and the fetters broken in pieces neither could any man tame him and always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying and cutting himself with stones you ever see people slit their wrists 
Yeah, think about that. Cutting themselves. Self-mutilation. We were made in the image of God, and these devils hate us. They look at us and they see the image of God that they tried to kill in the war in heaven. They hate us. And we should return the favor. But some people love these devils. But when he saw Jesus far off, he ran and worshipped him and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? Now Jesus, being God the Son, is allowed to ask, <laughs> What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country, now there was nigh, uh, there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. Swine feeding. There's a bunch of pigs. Unclean meat, right? Verse 12. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine that me, we may enter into them. Huh. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. There were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. You know what? These, the, even the pigs were smart enough to know that they didn't want to be possessed with devils. And they killed themselves rather than be possessed with devils. Think about that. Uh, is there a reason why maybe the Lord doesn't want us eating pig? Huh, I wonder if there's a spiritual application there, people. I don't know, I'm just throwing it out there. And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country, and, and they went out to see what it was that was done. And they came to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind and they were afraid. Oh yeah, they weren't afraid of the devils, but they were afraid of Jesus. And they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil, and also concerning the swine, and they began to pray him to depart out of their coasts. Oh yeah. Hey, uh, Jesus, would you do us a favor? Uh, leave, please. And when he was coming to the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but said unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath, and hath, and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in De Decalopolis uh, Dec how great things Jesus had done for him. And all men did marvel. The clean versus the unclean, right? You know, maybe that's why the Lord warned us, well, and Paul, not to be yoked with unbelievers. And, um, yeah, like I say, a hypocrite. Hypocrite alert. All right, in Ephesians 5.5, 5, for this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. However, hopefully, uh, we are smart enough to marry among our own people and the big problem I hear a lot is when two people get married and they have kids and they have a family and then one of them becomes a believer afterwards and the other one doesn't. 
big problem. I've heard this story so many times. I could, I could write a book. Matter of fact, I could be the book. But in 1 Corinthians 7, 14, we read, For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband, else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. Uh, I, do, uh, I do not believe that applies to I, I, I believe that people should marry amongst their own kind. Uh, that's, I believe the Bible teaches that. Uh, the Bible teaches over and over and over, kind after its own kind. Uh, don't mingle the seed of one item with a seed of another item. You know, you don't mingle corn with uh, asparagus or green beans with uh, green peppers. I just, I honestly think that the, the Lord wanted us to marry amongst our own kind. Why he put the Africans in Africa and the Asians in Asia and the Europeans in Europe. You know, doesn't mean that one's better than the other. If we were all God's creation, we have God's mark of ownership on us. And we should maintain that. Um, there is a verse in the Bible where it says, A mamzer shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. And that word mamzer means bastard. Well, in modern day usage, they say, well, that's that's a a woman who uh, didn't get married and her husband and the, guy, and the sperm donor ran off. Well, no, it means, uh, in the Hebrew, it means a mixed mongrel. Now, I don't know if that means interracial marriage. I don't know for a fact. But I do know this for a fact, that it had reference to the Canaanites. Uh, you can argue over who the Canaanites were, but, uh, you know, there's people that say that the white Europeans are the Canaanites. I don't believe that, but uh, there are those that teach that. So what can I tell you? But, you know, if you follow the Lord's rules and you get saved later, then your children are not unclean. And I believe that. In 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 11, it says, If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things. Okay. In Hebrews 10 and verse 29, of how much sore punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of Man, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. Wow. What did the uh, angel say unto Mary? Well, in Luke 1 and 35, And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing, therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. If there's a holy thing, there's unholy things, right? In 1 Timothy, 1 in verse 9, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy, unholy and profane, 
for murders of fathers and murders of mothers and for manslayers. 2 Timothy 3, 2, For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Uh, you can keep reading that. It's not a good thing. How about Romans 14, 14? I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. In other words, we're to be led of the Spirit. That's very, very important. In Galatians chapter 5, verse, uh, let's read 22. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Do you know that the Hebrew Roots people, basically they're telling you that they don't have the fruit of the Spirit because they want to bring you back under their laws, the laws. I mean, there's nothing wrong with the law. Um, but, you know, these, especially these Hebrew roots guys, Jesus said, just to look at a woman with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery already. I'm paraphrasing a little bit there, but, uh, I mean, how many guys do you know that, you know, see a gorgeous-looking woman and go, whew, I mean, come on. Oh, well, you committed adultery with her in your heart already you're guilty of the law hebrew roots hypocrites but if you're led of the spirit but the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace long-suffering gentleness goodness faith meekness temperance against such there is no law somebody give the hebrew roots people a memo for me please and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the afflictions, I'm sorry, with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Walk in the, live in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit. Not the law, people. I mean, come on. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. To that I say, amen. All right, one more, a couple more things here. Revelation 18.2, And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. Why did he say Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen? Well, two reasons. One, Babylon, physical Babylon, the physical location of Babylon fell and was destroyed by the Medes and the Persians. It was destroyed, totally. And in Isaiah, it said it would never to be rebuilt. I believe it was Isaiah. Yeah, I think it was Isaiah 14. I think. I'm not sure. Uh, but it was, it was prophesied to be destroyed, never to be rebuilt. So why does it say Babylon the Great has fallen has fallen? Well, in end times, there is a spiritual Babylon that's going to be destroyed. Think about that. The spirit of Babylon. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great has fallen, has fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit. Foul spirit, not F-O-W-L, F-O-U-L. Guys, have you ever fouled? your spark plugs well if you had an old car maybe but the new cars no and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird yeah if your uh, toilet got clogged for uh, a week it would have a foul odor so and a cage of every unclean 
and hateful bird. And if you don't know what Babylon is in the end times, I'll let you know a little secret. It's not Rome. Uh, Rome is evil. The Vatican is evil. It was infiltrated many years ago. But it's not going to be end time Babylon. End time Babylon is going to be Jerusalem. Believe it. The Bible says that Babylon killed the prophets. Jesus said Jerusalem killed the prophets. Do the math, people. Did you ever take algebra? If A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. Yeah. Yeah, two years of college and I learned that. Um, so if Jerusalem killed the prophets, and then the Lord says that Babylon killed the prophets, then Jerusalem has to be Babylon. And Jerusalem's also on seven hills, people along with Rome, Moscow, Seattle, Istanbul. I'm not sure about Mecca. All right, Revelation 16, 13. And I saw three unclean spirits. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet false prophet so if we're led by the spirit well let's read that again Galatians 5 22 but the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace long-suffering gentleness goodness faith meekness temperance against such there is no law and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections of and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Romans 14, 14, I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. And let us close out with 2 Corinthians 16, 17. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. I hope you learned something today. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to them and them alone, in Jesus' name, amen.